But before we start, I just wanted to say two things, take home messages, and hopefully there'll be more, but the two that I can think of. Number one, the, the old paradigm of, you know, one drug fits all or one treatment fits all just doesn't work anymore. All of you have different types of the same disease and different responses to different drugs, and this in and of itself is just amazing how differently everyone responds. And I think this is the take home, the number one take home message that we have to individualize treatment. You know, we have to sit down, talk to patients, and figure out where they're coming from and what will work best for them, number one. And I think the second take home message is in textbooks, when we go online or we read textbooks, we look at survival rate for lung cancer, and, you know, we, sometimes people get worried and they don't know what to expect. But those survival rates now, based on new lab tests, pathology, pathological testing, as well as new treatments that are constantly coming out, um, those survival, that survival data is changing constantly. In the past, you could say that you know stage three cancer had this much survival, stage four cancer had this much survival. But now, even for stage four lung cancer, we can we don't know what the survival is anymore. It's indefinite. And I think that is very, very heartening, at least for someone, you know, I've, I've heard stories from 20 years ago and, you know, 30 years ago when people didn't have that. And we have the hope now, I think, to say that, you know, a lot of different treatments are coming out and we can't listen to the textbook answers anymore. There's a lot of new things coming out. Lung cancer in 2010 was um, the second most diagnosed disease um, second to gastrointestinal carcinomas. I guess it's because, you know, colonoscopies are being done more and more, so they're picking up that up more. But lung cancers are an extremely important disease. Nearly 250,000 patients across the United States, just across the United States, are diagnosed each year. At least in 2010, that was the number. When a patient gets diagnosed with lung cancer, you know, 30 years ago, a biopsy was done, and it was cancer. And that was all they could pretty much give us. Now things have changed, and what's happened now is one biopsy, whether that's an FNA, which is a fine needle biopsy, or a core, which is what we should always go for, a core biopsy, because it's a little thicker needle, you get more tissue. So what they do is the pathologists take that tissue, or that piece of tumor or cancer, and they look at it under the microscope, and they either see small cells, which um, if they see small cells, it's called small cell lung cancer, or they see anything other than small cells in the lung. It's lung tissue, but it's either small cells or non-small cells. If it's not small cells that they see under the microscope, then automatically that whole group of cancer is called non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so small cell lung cancer we're not going to be talking about because it's basically a completely different disease. It's a neuroendocrine disease. It's very different. It grows faster, behaves differently, and it's, it's treated differently with different medications. Then, then there are the non-small cell lung cancers. And before, that's all we knew, that there's a bunch of non-small cell lung cancers. In 2000, there were a bunch of studies from three different universities that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine all at the same time. Um, and they, were, they started talking about this new mutation uh, called the EGFR mutation, which is the epidermal growth factor receptor mutation. And we have a diagram for it. Um, but basically, the epidermal growth factor receptor, they found that all cells obviously have an outside layer and an inside layer. And the outside layer has a lot of receptors that stick out of the cell. And that is, these are all cells, whether they be healthy or unhealthy cells. They have receptors sticking out of them. And these receptors, they stick out and they eat proteins from the blood, and it's those proteins that when they eat, those, those proteins go inside, stick to the target receptor, and then the cell grows, because that's how the cell gets its nutrition, and the cell continues to grow that way. So in a normal environment, that's good. We want our cells to grow. We want hair and nails and all those cells to grow, and that's fine. In cancer cells, we do not want that. And what happens in cancer cells is, and we haven't figured out why, but what happens is, for some reason, whether it's DNA damage or familial predisposition or something that happened like exposure to radiation or smoking or whatever it is, something happens where a cell doesn't die. Most cells live for a certain amount of time and then they die. That's the cell uh, life cycle and death cycle and they, all cells go through that. A cancer cell just doesn't die anymore. There's a problem that happens in the gene at the gene level and we're not exactly sure what the problem is. We have been identifying more and more mutations that we'll talk about. 
But because of that problem, the cell just doesn't die. It becomes immortal. And when it becomes immortal, it becomes an immortal clone, it just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's what cancer is. You don't have the, the control of the body on it. Although the body does try very, very hard to control it as much as possible, the cancer finds a way to grow around it. And, and that immortality is what we don't want. The EGFR mutation was found in around early 2000s. And what they found was a lot of lung cancer patients were expressing that receptor uh, in their tumor tissue. And they found that the EGFR mu mutation, or the EGFR, uh, the epidermal growth factor receptor, sat on the outside of the lung cancer cells. And because of a, mu a mutation in the receptor, it made the cell become immortal. So the mutation, uh, an inherent abnormality or an acquired abnormality in that receptor continued to keep the receptor on no matter what. Even when the cell didn't need to grow, the receptor was on and told the cell to grow and grow and grow and grow. And so they identified that mutation as one of the reasons um, for this immortality in lung cancer cells. So by 2005, you know, uh, a drug was really uh, identified and marketed for that. Initially, it was ERISA, and then it was Tarceva. They're both the same drugs. They basically target the epidermal growth factor receptor. And they target it by blocking that receptor. So if the receptor is Y-shaped, they sit in the middle of that receptor and block it from eating up the proteins outside. And so when it's blocked, the, hopefully the cell shrivels up and dies. And that's what a lot of the targeted agents are trying to do. But there are other uh, mutations and receptors that are targeted as well. Uh, the EGFR receptor is important because it's, we have a great drug for it, which is Tarceva, right? It's brilliant. If Tarceva works, in those patients that it works for, in those patients who are EGFR mutation positive, Tarceva has a response rate of up to, if, if it's going to work, it has a response rate of up to 80%. So we usually look for the EGFR receptor status um, through the pathology, so the biopsy needs to be done. Um, the problem is, though, that a lot of patients, you know, they go in, they have the biopsy done, either there isn't a lot of tissue, or, or if there is tissue, most of it has been used up in, you know, identifying what sort of cancer this is. And so what happens is that sometimes a lot of patients aren't left with a lot of tissue, and we have to sort of forego a lot of these testing, testing uh, methods, and we should not be doing that. A lot of doctors are just saying, a lot of doctors, and hopefully they're changing, but a lot of doctors are just saying that, you know, we know it's cancer, it's coming from the lung, let's just treat you as a lung cancer. But that is not the way we're supposed to be thinking of lung cancer anymore. If there isn't enough tissue, the guidelines are saying, get more tissue. I know it's inconvenient for the patient, and a lot of, a lot of my patients come in and, and I tell them, you know, I'm really sorry that you have to go through that, but I think you need more tissue because there isn't any tissue left over. There isn't anything left to be done. And I, I, I tell them that, you know, I, I give them the benefits of it. And the benefits are you have that tissue for a lot of other testing, other molecular profiling, sensitivity testing, and you can keep that with you for the next 10 years or so. We're not just trying to give you everything uh, other than the kitchen sink and see how it does. We're trying to individualize your treatment. And then... When we do it that way, I haven't had a single patient say no to that. All patients that I've spoken to, thank goodness, have always gone in for more tissue, and we've gotten extra testing done on them. And, and the importance of that is that, you know, obviously, we can individualize their treatment. So basically, biomarkers are anything, protein or mutation or anything at all, that can help us figure out how better to treat a lung cancer patient or any patient, but specifically in this, in this talk, a lung cancer patient. So we can look at genetic variants, and the EGFR mutation status is a genetic variant. It's a mutation that was acquired somehow. Based on that mutation, we can figure out whether the cells will live longer, how they will work, whether they will met metabolize, or whether they will metastasize, or what drugs can be used for them. And then you can do protein testing. And protein or proteinomic testing is basically looking at serum samples and measuring the amount of protein in that sample and figuring out how we can correlate the, the burden of that cancer based on the amount of tissue we're picking up or based on the amount of protein we're picking up. Uh, Varistrat, again, is an, another serum test. And what it does is it's not picking up 
EGFR mutations. It's picking up a response, an inflammatory response that the body has. We look at the cancer as a whole, as a ball of tissue, but there are lots of other cells floating around it. And so that's where metastatic disease comes from. And what this is doing, basically the Veristrat trust, what this is showing is that it picks up the proteins in the blood that are associated with that inflammatory response with that cancer. That's, that's what the Veristrat test does. But say, for example, we can't get enough tissue, or um, we have a patient who does have tissue but doesn't have the mutation. We still have other tests that we can use to see whether Tarsiva would be good for, for those patients or not. What the Veristrat test does, so there was a very large study done on Tarsiva patients. It was a BR21 study. And what they looked at, they looked at patients who were given the drug who had the EGFR mutation, and they did well, right? But there was a whole other number of patients who did not have the mutation. So when you checked for the mutation with PCR, FISH, and all those tests that I spoke about, they didn't have it. So in the public, if we just do a random analysis, 20% will have that mutation around, and 80% will not have that mutation based on this testing. However, when you look, when you substratify those 80% of patients, and you look at those 80% of patients, those 80% of patients, some of them still do well on Tarsiva. So what Veristrat does, and the reason I was really impressed with, with Veristrat, what happens right now is first-line chemo for advanced lung cancer, that's stage 3, B, 4, etc. Advanced lung cancer, you get chemo, or for stage four, you can get uh, Tarsiva. If you don't, if you have the EGFR mutation, if you do not have the EGFR mutation, second line is anyone's choice. It can be, you know, any drug you want. You can choose any doublet, any single agent, anything, or you can also use Tarsiva. That to me wasn't an ideal situation because even in this room, as I said, everyone is different. So what Veristrad does is it identifies those patients who are EGFR mutation negative, but still may be susceptible to Tarsiva. So what it does is it identifies those patients as Veristrat good or Veristrat poor. If they're Veristrat poor, it means that their protein profile is not um, sensitive to the drug, and they will probably not be sensitive to the drug at all. If they are Veristrat good, which around 50% of those patients, or 60% of those patients are, then there's a high likelihood that the drug may actually work really, really well for them. So that's why even though a patient may be EGFR mutation negative, that doesn't mean that they can't get Tarsiva. They can, it's even approved for that blindly, to be given blindly in the second line setting. But what Veristrad does is it sort of identifies, so you're not wasting your time, but you have more of an idea. So if the Veristrad test is poor, then you'd much rather go with something else that may work better for your disease rather than spending three to six months trying a drug that has a low likelihood of working. Because that's what it's all about. It's about waiting and choosing the ideal treatment um, because th we should try to treat this as a long-term disease. We should wait and use what we need most at the, at the most opportune moment. And what, what individualizing therapy can do is if we could get what we like to do, what I like to do in patients with lung cancer is basically get their sample, test them for their molecular profiling, and then also do some sort of chemosensitivity testing for that as well, if we have enough tissue. And chemosensitivity testing is basically in those patients who are not susceptible or are not going to be able to get targeted therapy, we can you know, put their tissue into Petri dishes and figure out where they would get maximal, maximum cell kill. Would they get it with cisplatin? Would they get it with the taxanes? What sort of regimen would work best for them? So there's a lot of things that are coming out that are new. Not everything is 100%, as I said, but at least it gives us an idea of what to go with. So these agents are the ones that are most commonly used. We're still using them. Alimta is excellent for adenocarcinoma. Cisplatin is excellent for all cancers across the board. So are taxanes. In fact, um, Cisplatin and a taxane, or a carboplatin and a taxane, is the number one choice um, for carcinoma for lung cancers right now. Targeted therapies is are, are used basically when we identify specific receptors. So you must have heard of Avastin, and um, 
which is bevacizumab, which targets the vascular epidermal growth factor receptor, which is basically, we were talking about metastatic disease. And the vascular epidermal growth factor receptor is one of the things that the cancer cells carry around with them. And they express that. And by expressing this, they make their own um, blood vessels. And so they have their own blood vessels, which sort of, like parasites, stick onto our blood vessels and then use our blood to help them grow and get nutrition. So by targeting that vascular epidermal growth factor receptor, Avastin is hopefully trying to cut off that blood supply to the tumor and shrink the tumor growth. Well, so basically, again, so my, the, the take home points, as I said, was everyone, we can individualize therapy right now. You should be asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Keep asking for more diagnostic tests if needed. Not all of them are needed all the time. So it's not like, you know, go with a list of 20 tests, but you know, you should have an idea as a lung cancer patient, you should know what your EGFR mutation profiling is. You should know exactly what cycles you've got. You should even sometimes know there are other tests you can do to see whether you're sensitive to platinum agents or taxane agents, right? There is chemosensitivity. You should be wondering about all of that because we, you know, are going to be around for a long time, right? And we, God willing, and we want to, as I said, use the best drugs at the best time and not use everything up front. And I think, I guess that's the take home message. Try to individualize your treatment as much as possible. Call here, call me anytime. I'd love to answer any questions that you have. And um, I think